We're glad you're here this morning. I'm going to start the announcements and trust that those out in the, the lobby and other areas will start to filter in. We're glad you're here today. We want to welcome you, especially if you're a um, new time, a new visitor with us, a, a, a new worshiper. But whether you've been with us for quite a while or you're new to us this morning, uh, we do like to highlight the perforated part of the bulletin. It's uh, right here. And you would, uh, if there's any way we could pray for you, encourage you, anything you'd like, maybe you'd like to encourage us. Maybe God's been doing something in your life and there's a testimony that you want to share of some sort, a story or whatever. Just there's some space there. You can write, write it in and put it in the purple offering box that's outside the sanctuary and we'd greatly appreciate it. So again, any way we could pray for you, encourage you, um, that's what that's there for. There are a few announcements I do want to highlight. So you see the date now for Alan Doerr's uh, memorial service. It's October 22nd. It'll be here at the church, and we're going to have it outside because of some uh, COVID concerns that, that some have. Um, but we'll be having the service outdoors in the parking lot. So uh, if you have any questions, you could see me or go talk to um, Annette as well. Uh, she's here this morning. Uh, also, right after the worship service today, we have a special congregational meeting. We're very pleased, uh, uh, grateful, humbled, all that stuff. We have uh, six folks that uh, we're voting on for membership this morning, and that's uh, we'll probably have like a five-minute uh, break. That's ideally, of course, um, maybe five to ten-minute break, uh, but we'll round you up after the service, and we hope to uh, vote on uh, the recommendations of the, the six members you see there in the con in the bulletin. And finally, there's a, a prayer meeting tonight that um, I really encourage you to, to, to come out to that. Uh, there's so much to pray for. Um, and that's at 6 o'clock tonight. So I hope to see you here tonight. Um, anything I'm missing except for, I guess we could sing happy birthday to Audrey, but we don't really want to embarrass her, so I won't mention her name uh, this morning. It is your birthday, right? Did I hear correctly? Okay. Did Parker make a cake or anything for you? Or? Yeah? Okay. Well, we're glad you're all here this morning. Um, let's uh, turn our attention to the Lord and worship. Darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own Brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. to the lies I'm not afraid to leave my past behind I won't be shaken I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in
doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your guys when we were practicing I should do some motions with this song for the kids to get involved and for the adults too because I think sometimes it's helpful just to move your bodies and as we're praising the Lord so I'm just gonna do it <laughs> and the, it might seem corny but it'll just help us get into the song and remember so if the kids would help us along with some of these too they're just very simple the first one right here. We're one in the spirit. We are one in the spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the spirit. We are one
when I rise in the morning, when I rise in the morning, when I rise, give me Jesus, give me Jesus. Let's go to prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, you are our rock and our refuge, our strength and stronghold, and ever present help in time of need. Therefore, because of you, the fact that you are our rock and refuge and an ever present stronghold in time of need, there, because of that, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, we know that there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, and she will not fail. God will help her at the break of day, Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall, and that's what we're experiencing right now in our days. But you lift up your voice and the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us, God with us, Emmanuel. 
The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let's come and see the works of your hand, Lord, the desolations you brought on the earth. You make wars cease in the ends of the earth, and you break the bow, and you shatter the spear. You burn the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted on the earth. The Lord Almighty God is with us. The city of Jacob is our fortress. Father, this morning, we want to quiet our hearts before you. As you, as you say, cease striving and know that I am God. And um, we're, we're a people full of fear and full of anxiety full of stress but we know that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world we thank you again that you are a rock and refuge and strength and stronghold and ever-present help in time of need father this morning i just pray that our hearts will be quiet before you for a minute or so and just rest in that in that knowledge in that truth that you are a shepherd that you're going to take care of us that again, though we may not know what our future holds, we know who holds our future. And just with the knowledge that we can cast our anxieties on you for you care for us. And we know that you will give us perfect peace when our minds are fixed on you, the author and perfecter of our faith. And so just in this minute, I pray that you would help us to quiet our hearts before you, cease striving in our lives, and just know that you are God. Father, this morning we come to you with hungry hearts. We lay our lives before you, and we ask that you'd pour out your spirit and teach us what we need to know this morning. Um, we come to you with hungry hearts and open hearts and transparent hearts, and um, we know that you love us very much, and you desire us to grow in you and put aside our, our anxieties and trust you, help us to trust you more and depend upon you more. I, um, we pray for the persecuted church and we thank you for what you have done in Eritrea and delivering many, many people from those terrible situations in Eritrea and delivering them. And we pray that you continue to work um, through the government and other ways, Lord, to release more prisoners in Eritrea. We ask for for uh, prayer for the persecuted church around the world in China and North Korea and Vietnam and many, many other, Somalia, Sudan, um, Iran, Iraq, many persecuted places. We ask, Father, that you would give them courage to remain faithful to you and, to, and uh, provide for their emotional and physical needs as only you can. Help them to know that you are with them and help them to know that we're praying for their church. We pray for Bob Shea and we just ask you to be with him as he goes in for more tests and just anxiety and fear. And I just pray that you would wrap him up with your love. Um, we pray um, uh, for Annette and the loss of her husband, continue to bring her comfort and her family as well. Um, and so Father, we just ask for your spirit to be upon Pastor Bob as he preaches your word. And we pray for uh, just power and clarity and the power of your Holy Spirit to touch hearts in this congregation this morning. And we ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Let's uh, continue to pray as the Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Also, before we get into the message this morning, I wanted to pray for Jane Tucker's uh, uh, brother, Dave. I guess he was uh, tested positive for COVID, and so uh, he had some pre-existing conditions. So let's just uh, pray for him real quick. Father, you alone know Dave's heart. He probably, I mean, none of us really even know fully ourselves, and he perhaps doesn't know what to think about this or how to deal with this. And Paul rightly prayed about our anxieties, and we, we probably take it for granted that he has some anxiety through all this, and we just pray that uh, he would know your presence and that he would uh, uh, give all of his cares to you through this, and I pray that you'd surround him with good uh, medical people that can take care of him, and we commit Dave to you, Lord Jesus. I pray he'd walk with you through this. Uh, shield him from maybe being angry at you or questioning you too much. I mean, this is unfortunate. Uh, we pray, though, that he um, would find that you do love him and you'll care for him through this. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Wrapping up First Peter this morning. And I'm not really sure how long this message is going to last. So... Um, I don't know, I was thinking this week, and I haven't done this for a while, and we'll see if we have some adequate time, but if you have any questions, thoughts, uh, things that uh, you might want to ask me about First Peter, I'd be glad to, maybe we may have a little Q&A after the service this morning before we have our, our, our vote and a little break after the service, so Again, uh, maybe I was supposed to ask you, maybe there's been somebody here for weeks that said, you know, something you preach X number of weeks ago really bugged me, or I don't have any, I have some questions about this or that, or maybe you're here this morning for the first time and you'll hear something that you have a question about. Again, we'll see uh, how much time we have. <clears throat> so, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 12 through 14, and this is sort of a summary message uh, that will cover really a, a few themes, but the themes that recur throughout the book. So verse 12 of 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter says, With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. This is the word of God. And so, as we summarize this book that we've been in for a number of months now, and then next week we'll start... Second Peter, the main idea that I want to share with you is that God's grace gives us all we need to stand firm. And of course, Peter, we just read, he gives us the reason why he wrote this book. He says, I've written to you briefly with the help of Silas. Silas was maybe a secretary that was taking word-for-word uh, -word dictation from Peter. We're not sure exactly how this worked, but Silas helped him write down this, this letter he says, I've written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. Again, so everything that we read up to this point, Peter regards as God's true grace. All the teaching, all the themes, all the subjects, all the warnings are all considered by Peter to be an expression of the grace of God so that we can stand fast or stand firm in the hardships that are going to come. And Peter is, again, writing to those who he considers to be exiles th scattered throughout Asia. And they need encouragement. And they need God's grace to stand. And so 
the thought that came to my mind this week as I looked at this, and this is a little bit a building from last week as well, is that grace is powerful. And again, Jesus is powerful. Because we talked a little bit about this last week, that there is no such thing as grace. That is, grace is not some blobby substance that God says, here, here's some grace because I know you're going to need it to stand firm. No, instead, grace always comes to us through and in Jesus Christ. So when we say, I need the grace of God, what we are saying is, I need Jesus to stand. I am not strong enough in and of myself Ask Peter, Peter thought he was strong enough, no matter what else anybody else does or says, I will stand with you. Really, Peter. And Peter learned the hard way that, that he did not have the strength to stand. He needed Jesus and the prayers of Jesus to restore him, to help him to stand. Grace is powerful. That is, Jesus, as he comes to us, is powerful. There's that old hymn, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And you know the words in the second verse. Through many dangers. You've been through many dangers, toils and snares. If you're older than six months old, I think you'd probably have to say yes. Yes. <laughs> Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace has brought me safe thus far. So anytime you see that word grace, it's, it's God's kindness and His, His merciful disposition to me in Christ. Tis grace has brought me safe thus far. Grace is powerful. Jesus is powerful. And grace will lead me home. If you ever find yourself in the presence of God, we just sang the song, you can have all this world, but give me Jesus. And someday when you're beyond this world, after death, and now you're in the presence of God, there's this eternal life. If you're ever there, it's not because you were strong enough. It's not because you were dedicated enough or even that you persevered enough. All those are good things. But it's because He preserved you. He prayed for you. Grace led you home. Grace is powerful, and Jesus is powerful. Now, Newton also, in that song, he said, and we're going to look at this later, but it's grace that taught my heart to fear. I want you to think about that. Just pause on that thought for a moment. Really? Grace? Taught my heart? Jesus? You came to me in the kind disposition of your Father? You, you taught me to fear? We don't often associate fear with grace, right? But then Newton goes on to say, and grace my fears what? So it's this whole full-orbed expression of Jesus. Grace is powerful. Jesus is powerful. But he, he's not just, grace isn't just some blue-eyed blonde, if you will. Grace is Jesus coming to us. And we'll look at that in a moment, how Peter summarizes that. And God's grace gives us all we need to stand firm. And we may have times in the near future... Perhaps, even in this country, and Paul prayed for the, perse the persecution of believers throughout this world is a given. It seems in America, maybe a different gospel is preached, and we're not expected to suffer. We're expected to have our best life now. Well, I want to remind you this morning of three final things related to God's grace Again, Michael Horton says, just in case I haven't made my point, in grace, God gives us nothing less than Himself. 
Grace, then, again, is not a third thing or some substance mediating between God and sinners, but it is Jesus Christ in redeeming actions. So these three reminders I want to give you will help us to stand firm. Because, again, this is not a, necessarily a, a message to warn you, but sooner or later you're going to find that your strength and your resolve and your ability to persevere will not get you through the next day. And that's not a bad place to be, by the way. Because then you're at the mercy of this kind God, and you say, I, I need you like never before. So, let me give you the first two reminders of grace. And these first two are going to kind of morph into each other, and they'll, I'll spend more time there and then a little shorter time on the third reminder. But first of all, Grace is, a, is encouraging and costly. If you look at verse 12, again, Peter says, With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you. Parakalo is the, the Greek word. It's the, the parakalit, the, 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 the encouragement, and the Holy Spirit is called this as well. I, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying. That word testifying has has a, a core word related to our English word martyr. So Peter says, I'm, I'm, I'm writing to you this grace of God, I'm, I'm encouraging you in this grace, but I'm also testifying or, or, or being a witness, that word is also translated testifying or witnessing. Again, it's related to our English word martyr. Then go back to chapter 5, verse 1. To the elders among you I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings. That word appeal is the same word parakalo. I appeal, I I encourage, but as a a fellow elder and a witness or a martus, martyr of Christ's sufferings. I think the connotation here is that when grace is given to us and when we experience the coming of Jesus, it's both encouraging, but it's going to cost us. And so we need to remember that grace is encouraging and costly. The pairing of these two words in the space of 12 verses, if you will, not that they had verses when Peter wrote this, But chapter 5, verse 1, then chapter 5, verse 12, you have both the encouragement and the martyrdom, if I can say it that way. (laughs) Now, this word wasn't originally used in the sense of martyrdom, but it it quickly took on those connotations. You ever heard of the phrase cheap grace? Cheap grace really is an oxymoron. Following Jesus from whom all grace comes will cost us our lives. It must cost us our lives. Any other kind of grace that is is not costly will not motivate us to stand firm. It will be too cheap to die for. The other day I was sitting in my study and there was this old classic Cadillac. It was a 49 Cadillac pulled up. And then a 52 Cadillac, and then a, if I remember right, a 56, and then a 46. I mean, there are four different Cadillacs parked outside my, my, uh, my study. They're beautiful. We went out, took some pictures. I'll show you some pictures. There's a pink one, too. <laughs> a pink Cadillac. I think those were costly vehicles. I had a friend when I was growing up in high school, he had a Ford Pinto. You remember the Ford Pinos? (laughs) Some of you are too young to remember those death traps. But he had a Ford Pinto, wasn't worth much. The grace we have is a classic Cadillac. It's costly. It's not a Ford Pinto. Let me read you just a few words from Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his book, The Cost of Discipleship. Again, Peter is encouraging you. So there's the, obviously grace is encouraging, right? 
that we have this one-way love that no matter what we do or how many times we fail, Jesus is there for us to restore us, to pray for us, to care for us, to love us. That's encouraging, right? The costly part we need reminded of. And this is what Bonhoeffer, he was a martyr in World War II. And this is what he says in his book, The Cost of Discipleship. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, absolution without personal confession, and cheap grace is grace without discipleship again. It's without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ. How can you have grace without Jesus Christ? That's one of the points I've been trying to make. Then he says, costly grace is the treasure hidden in the field. For the sake of it, a man will go and sell all he has. I I want that pink Cadillac. It is the pearl of great price to buy which the merchant will sell all of his goods. It is the kingly rule of Christ for whose sake a man will pluck out the eye which causes him to stumble. It is the call of Jesus Christ at which the disciple leaves his nets and follows him. Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again, the gift which must be asked for, the door at which a man must knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow. And I should interject, you know, it's, yes, you're, you come to a point of justification once. You don't have to be justified every day and keep coming back to get justified. But it's not, but what, what, what Bonhoeffer is writing against is this idea that, yes, I prayed this prayer. I have God's grace over me, and so now I don't have to, to forsake all out of my love for him. I can just, you know, I'm, I'm under grace, and we'll talk about that in a moment. That's what Bonhoeffer is against. So he says, such grace is costly because it causes, calls us to follow. And it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a man and a woman his life, and it is grace because it gives us the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin and grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it costs God the Son, costs God the life of His Son. You were bought at a price. And what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. Again, Peter, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you, and epimartuin to you the I'm testifying that this is the true grace of God. Above all, it is grace because God did not reckon His Son too dear a price to pay for our life, but delivered Him up for us. Then I like Bonhoeffer's last line here. He says, costly grace is the incarnation of God. Isn't that beautiful? Costly grace is... The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Peter's saying that the only kind of grace that will empower you to stand firm is the, the Cadillac grace, not the, the Ford Pinto grace. <laughs> grace is encouraging and costly. And I'm sorry, I know you've heard this quote many times, but those of you who might be new here this morning haven't heard this. So one of my favorite, most riveting quotes that I've read about grace came from Tim Keller in his book, The Prodigal God. I'm going to read it to you again. And if you've heard it before, just fake it. Just act like you you haven't heard it. So Tim Keller is a pastor in New York City, and this is what he said. Some years ago, I met a woman who began coming to Redeemer. That's the church where I am a minister. She said that she had gone to a church growing up and she had always heard that God accepts us only if we are sufficiently good and ethical. She had never heard the message that she was now hearing that we can be accepted by God by sheer grace through the work of Christ. 
regardless of anything we do or have done. She said, that is a scary idea. Oh, it's good scary, but still scary. Keller says, I was intrigued. I asked her what was so scary about unmerited free grace. She replied something like this. If I was saved by my good works, then there would be a limit to what God could ask of me or put me through. I would be like a taxpayer with rights. I would have done my duty and now I would deserve a certain quality of life. But, But if it is really true that I am a sinner saved by sheer grace at God's infinite cost, then there's nothing He cannot ask of me. Grace is encouraging and costly. Let me take you to the second reminder. We need true grace. True grace. Again, Bonhoeffer put an adjective in front of grace. He called it cheap grace. But isn't it interesting that Peter says here, this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. What do you think he's, he means by that? This is the true grace of God. This first thought that I have for you is, is not much of a stretch. The other part is more of a conjecture on my part, but I think I can make a good case for it. But I think he's saying there, this is the true grace of God because there's perhaps a false grace (laughs) that's my first thought that there's a grace that is not true that there is a grace that is being taught even during Peter and Paul's time that was not reflective of true grace and what do I mean by that so if you have your Bibles turn to 2nd Peter chapter 3 2nd Peter chapter 3 Let me begin at verse 14. This is toward the end of the book. Peter says, So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, that is the new heaven and the new earth where righteousness dwells, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with Him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. Just as our dear brother Paul. You see, Peter is familiar with with some of Paul's writings, which he deemed as Scripture. Just as our dear brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all of his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other Scriptures to their own destruction. Now, what I'm going to suggest to you that these false teachers, and Peter warns about them throughout 2 Peter, the things that they are twisting of Paul's teaching was exactly the grace of God. Paul, I mean, Peter alluded to the patience of God and, and just the, the, the forbearance and kindness of God, and this is being distorted, especially Paul's teachings on this, and Let me try to show you this briefly, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. You can go to it yourself and look it up and get out a good study Bible, and you'll get some ideas and thoughts on it. But Romans chapter 3, if you have your Bibles, you might want to turn there. Romans chapter 3, and I'm just going to jump in at verse 7. Someone might argue, if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness, and so increases his glory, that is, when I am uh, a liar, and when I uh, am speaking uh, falsities, God comes along in his truth, and we could see the, the huge contrast between the truth of God and our falseness, and so God's glory is enhanced because we see how true he is. Apparently, there were some people that were teaching Hey, Paul, you're, what you're saying is that we can go sin, that grace may abound. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But 
So, verse 8, why not say, as some slanderously claim that we say, let us do evil that good may result. You see how they're twisting what Paul had taught? I think that's what Peter is referring to in 2 Peter chapter 3. Let us do evil that good may result. They slanderously claim that that's what we say. And Paul says their condemnation is just. Jump over to chapter 6, verse 1. I already alluded to this. But we're talking about we need true grace. We don't need the grace that says, I prayed a prayer 20 years ago and now it doesn't really matter how I live. I was watching a clip on the internet this week and it was the show, the, I guess from the show The Bachelorette. Anybody? I know some of you just, just have to watch The Bachelorette and The Bachelor. And this, this bachelorette, she claimed to be an ardent follower of Jesus Christ. But she had revealed to her man that she was, I don't know how the show goes exactly, you know, trying to narrow it down to a, one person she's going to marry, and he claimed to be a Christian as well. And, and she told him that she had not been faithful morally, sexually, before marriage, and she, he had a real problem with that. And she says, don't judge me. No one can judge me. I'm, I'm under God's grace. He loves me no matter what. And that's true. But you see what Paul is saying here in chapter 6, verse 1? It is true that God loves you even when you mess up. Even when you sin. I mean, that's the gospel. It's not all the gospel, but that's gospel truth what shall we say then chapter 6 verse 1 shall we go on sinning that grace may increase by no means we are those who have died to sin how can we live in it any longer look at chapter 6 verse 15 what then shall we sin because we not are not under the law but under grace by no means Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness? You see, Paul was being accused of preaching the big word that theologians like to use is antinomianism. That means against the law. That is, if I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, I no longer have to keep the law. Well, you no longer have to keep the law to be saved. You never, we never kept the law to be saved. None of us could ever keep the law. The law only showed us how, far we, how short we fell. If someone when that wrote on that pink Cadillac that drove up the other day, don't touch the pink Cadillac, you know what I would want to do? I did touch it, by the way. but <laughs> They didn't have a sign on it, though, but. Anyway, true grace. Now, this isn't the point of my sermon, but let me just take a quick pause here, a little side trail. Martin Lloyd-Jones, he was a British preacher. I think he died in 62, 63. But he says, if you are not accused of antinomianism whenever you are preaching the gospel of God's grace, you are probably not preaching the gospel of God's grace. Because Paul was misunderstood as saying, look, it doesn't matter, I'm under grace. I can live any way I want. And what Peter is trying to say at the end of 1 Peter is that that kind of grace, that, that kind of false grace, will not motivate you and move you and inspire you and empower you to stand firm. Who wants to die for a pinto? Right? Who will stand firm for that kind of cheapness that it costs Jesus his life? That's what motivates us to stand firm. Now, we're going back to Newton. uh, John Newton. He wrote many different hymns, not just Amazing Grace, but I'm going to finish up this point with just this line from one of his songs. He said, Our pleasure and our duty, though opposite before, since we have seen his beauty, are joined to part no more. 
And we could chew on that for a long time, but basically what he's saying is, look, he said, before we saw Jesus, we had pleasure and we had duty, and they were opposite. It's like, I know I should do this, but I have pleasure over here, and, and, and they're at war with each other. But then when we see the costly grace of Jesus, of God giving himself to us in his Son, our duty to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our pleasure, they join. Depart no more. And that's what Peter is calling us to. I want you to stand firm in the true grace of God, a grace that is costly. Now, last of all, grace empowers us as exiles. If you look at verse 13, Peter said, she who is in Babylon. Babylon? What, what, what are you talking about, Peter? This is a code word, especially it's used many, many different times in the book of Revelation, by the way. But she who is in Babylon, you have any idea where that is? It's Rome, probably, most likely. It's kind of a way to protect the believers who are in Rome. But Babylon, who in the Old Testament, that stood for just about anything and everything ungodly and full of pride and self. Peter is saying the church who is in Rome or Babylon chosen together with you, sends her greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. That was probably pre-COVID, in case you, you need to know that. And then peace to all of you who are in Christ. Did you see the tension there? There's in Babylon, and there's in Christ. So the point I want to make in your outline, if you're following, is that we reside in Babylon, Rome, Grand Rapids, New York City, Portland. You, you, you fill in the city or the town. We, we, live, we reside there. But we live in Christ. And that really is one of the big mega themes throughout the whole book. <laughs> is he, he starts off the book addressing the exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, and Bithynia. So you're scattered, you're, you're uh, residing in Babylon, but then verse 2 of 1 Peter chapter 1, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ sprinkled with his blood grace and peace be yours in abundance so we reside in babylon but we live in christ i'm going to read you just a couple verses from from hebrews hebrews chapter 11 i just i just love how the writer there lays this out by faith, Abraham, when he called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents. T-E-N-T-S. <laughs> you jump over to verse 13. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. I love that metaphor of a tent. A lot of you know that I like to hike. The last time I hiked, I brought some steel rebar, some mortar, and some brick. Put it in my backpack, and I was going to build a real enduring structure on the trail. Say, no. 
you brought the lightest tent that you could carry. <laughs> and why? The trail's a temporary place. It was not meant to, to build some magnificent structure and settle down and say, I'm going to find my significance, my security in Babylon. In Rome, because you won't find it. You just won't find it here. If you have the Holy Spirit of God within you, right now He is groaning, groaning, calling you to your eternal home. It doesn't mean that you can't enjoy this, this, this world and the, the, the gifts that God gives you here in this, in this world, but it's never going to fully satisfy. It's not meant to. The gifts are meant to evoke you and to get, create a longing to you to... To say, I've got a better home that I'm looking forward to, whose builder and maker is God. So God's grace empowers us to live as exiles because when stuff comes down <laughs> and the persecution and the suffering comes, we're not going to be surprised at the painful suffering that we're going through on behalf of Christ, especially if it's on behalf of Christ. It's like, he said it was coming. I can stand firm. I don't have to have everything work out perfectly here. It's not meant to. Final question and assurance, and then I think I might have a couple of minutes to, to open it up. The question is, will we stand firm till the end? especially when persecution and suffering come. We will, if our faith is in the God of all grace, He, not our resolve, just ask Peter, He guarantees our inheritance and through faith will shield us by His power. So, Anybody have a real easy question you might want to ask me? Or any? I felt like maybe this might be a good thing to, way to wrap up the series on 1 Peter. Any thoughts? If not, that's fine. We'll go to our benediction. But any, any questions, comments? Going. Going. Okay, let's stand for our benediction then. It's your last chance while I'm turning to Jude. Okay. After the benediction, we'll have a, a break for a few minutes. But if you're here this morning and you're not quite sure if you've appropriated by faith the grace of God, that is the kindness of Jesus Christ coming to you. Maybe you've heard that He's kind and you've heard stories that, that He loves you and He loves prodigals and he, he died for you, but you're not really sure that that's something that you've made personal. That you are not quite sure that you're a follower. Please come and see me, and I'd, I'd be glad to explain to you further the grace of God in Christ. So to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. And God's people said, Amen.